All right. Well, if you uh, have been following along, we are uh, now in our sixth series, or sixth series, sixth part of our series, uh, entitled Growing with the Giants. And uh, our theme this year has been to grow. And so we're calling this year Growth 2020. And uh, the idea is, is to grow in every area of our lives, right? We don't want to remain stagnant. We don't want to remain the same people that we used to be. We want to change. We want to grow. We want to be new. We want to flourish in our lives financially, physically, uh, obviously spiritually. We want to we want to grow in our families. We want to grow in our occupations and, and all of the things in our life. We don't want to leave uh, one stone unturned. We don't want to leave uh, uh, one leaf untouched. We want to do it all, don't we? And uh, I don't think that that's common in the world today. I think that there are a lot of uh, average Joes. There are a lot of uh, average people. There are a lot of common, just ordinary, everyday type of individuals. And now I know that God can do uh, extraordinary things with ordinary people. He's done that in the scripture. He does that in real life. I mean, when we think about us and, and the culture we live in, we think of people like the, the D.L. Moody's and the Billy Graham's and all of these other people that we, that we just uh, rave about. And, and, and essentially, they were just ordinary people that were sold out for God. But you see, they wanted to grow. I don't think for one second that these, uh, these great men of, of faith, I don't think for one second that Jeff Bezos and, and, uh, and uh, Warren Buffett, they woke up one day and said, I really just don't care. I don't think they took a complacent attitude about life. They, were your, uh, they had that kind of 10x personality, you know, kind of that go get them. We're going to do this. We're going to do it right. We're going to do the best that we can. We are, gonna, we are just going to work hard. And that should be really the picture of our lives, trying to do better than what we used to do. Our life should continually increase. And when I think about this year, 2020, this is the growth year for me. I'm thinking about many different ways that I'm trying to grow. I'm setting just really extraordinary goals, crazy goals, the ones that don't even make sense, like that's impossible. But I think that's when God really will work. Because if we set a goal that we can attain, then when we arrive, who gets the glory, right? We do. When we say, we're going to set some goals, we're going to do something that's going to be miraculous. We want to, we want to work hard. We want to, we want to work like we've never worked before and try to reach a goal that is just beyond our reach. So then when we actually get there, you say, God did this. This wasn't me. It wasn't because of a craft. It wasn't because of a talent. It was because of God. And when I look at people in the Bible, I think we can learn a lot from them. If we can't learn from their good example, we can learn from their bad one. So we are in the story of Joseph this morning. Last week, we talked about Abraham. The week before that, we talked about Cain and Abel. The week before that, we talked about Eve. The week before that, we talked about Adam. So we're just kind of marching through Genesis. We're not going to be here forever. Uh, Joseph does a, a, he dominates the latter part of Genesis. I mean, pretty much it's all really about what he went through rising to the top. And we can learn a lot from his adversity. We can learn how to grow, how to be better Christians because of what Joseph went through. So open your Bible, if you would, to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. And as you go there, let me just kind of lay the groundwork a little bit. There's some assumptions we need to make when we're talking growth, okay? When we're talking growth, we have to assume some things. And, and some of you might say, well, the, the assumption I'm going to make sounds pessimistic, okay? And, and I would say that I am, I am not a, the glass is half empty kind of guy. I'm the glass is full kind of guy. I don't think of me as a pessimist. I really think of me as an optimist. So, so don't use this against me. I'm simply saying that what I'm going to lay here, this groundwork for you, sounds pessimistic. It sounds almost fatalistic, okay? So here's the groundwork that I want to lay. This is the assumption that we need to make when it comes to growth. When it comes to growth, ready? Watch this. No one is looking out for you but you. No one is looking out for you but you. That's the assumption we have to make when it comes to growth. You are your best advocate. Nobody is going to want it more than you want it. 
People around you might might want it as bad or worse than you want it, but they're not going to want it for you as bad as you want it. You're kind of like that. uh, They say you're only as strong as your weakest link. Well, you become that weakest link. You're the one that it's kind of the buck stops with you. I mean, it doesn't, it, they're not going to push you beyond what you want. You, you, might, uh, you might experience some growth in your life at times, but it's only because you've yielded and you've leaned into that. You understand what I'm saying? Nobody's in it like you will be in it. So the assumption we have to make this morning is no one is looking out for you but you. And when it comes to Joseph's life, this is really a fulfillment. This is really a fulfillment. And we're going to look at uh, three, essentially three groups of people. Uh, First of all, let's look at point one, Joseph's brothers. Joseph's brothers. Now, in order to grow, you kind of have to face uh, a a gauntlet, if you will, kind of the giant. I don't know. How many of you guys have older brothers? Oh, wow. Okay. How many of you guys have younger brothers? Let me see. Younger brothers. How How many of you don't have any brothers at all? Okay, you are blessed out of your mind. No, okay, it's interesting. My kids, so Josh, I have to do this to Ben. Ben is older than Josh, but Josh is stronger than Ben. It's just true. Is it not true? Yes, okay. Of course, Josh says yes, yeah. And so oftentimes, oftentimes, I look at Josh, and I said, stop beating up on your older brother. It just is funny when I say that. So anyway. Now, Ben is like, I don't know if he's stronger than me or not. But anyway, um, you know, if, if you, when you grew up in your house and you got an older brother, you realize that your older brother is kind of always just kind of beat up on you. And, and maybe in your case, maybe it was your younger brother always beat up on you. I don't know. Hopefully it wasn't your sister. Hopefully if you did any beating up, it was on your sister. You know, it's okay. It's in the Bible. It's in first opinions. Let's look open there if you will. You can beat up on your, on your sister. Um, I had a sister that I did not beat up on. I harassed her with my mouth, though, all the time. I always said things, you know. And there is this video. I'm totally digressing. There is this video where she, ha- she is, she is, uh, is, she, is she recording? Who's recording? I'm recording. Okay, I'm trying to remember how this video went. It was years ago. I'm recording this video, and I must have been 13 or 14. I kind of had one of these voices, you know. And uh, we did have video quarters back then, camcorders, and I was, I said, this is Angie having a spaz. This is my sister, Angie. And I don't know what happened, but she hit that camera, and it fell on the ground, and it was just, it was done. I don't know, maybe it, it turned off or something like that. So I never, I never physically harassed her, but man, I just verbally harassed her all the time, and that was the way I did it. Anyway, so that's a little story about me. When you're, when you're trying to grow, though, back to the, the topic on hand, when you're trying to grow in your life, Sometimes you have to face this gauntlet, right? This group of people. And in, for Joseph's case, in Joseph's case, uh, the first people he had to overcome was his brothers. Uh, he really had a tough time with those people that were with him. And sometimes it's, it's not always easy, isn't it? Sometimes it's not easy facing the giants. One author says, do the next thing even when it's not the easiest thing. And how many times do we forfeit growth in our life? Because it's just not easy. How many of us hit a roadblock when we're setting our goals and we're almost to March now? Two months now setting goals. We've been working on these things, trying to be steadfast with them. And things are not easy. You know, maybe you're trying to go to the gym. Maybe you're trying to... Uh, you know, stop doing a habit or start, maybe you're trying to create a new habit and it's just not easy. And sometimes we have to do the next thing, even if it's not the easiest thing. And then for Joseph, for Joseph, it was he had to grow up. Joseph had a lot of growing up to do. And, and we read this wonderful account in Genesis 37. So open up there, Genesis 37, beginning in verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than his children more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here, I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For, behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and, lo, my sheaves arose and stood, and also stood upright. 
And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shall thou indeed reign over us, or shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream. And he told his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, oh, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him. His father observed his sayings. When we look back at verse 3, we see that Joseph is this favored son. Uh, he didn't ask to be favored. It's something that just kind of came his way. He was favored because he was uh, the son of Israel's old age. And now, in verse 4, Joseph was hated for that. And I, I find just a tremendous pause here. Can I say this and encourage you, if you have, if you have kids... Or, or, or grandkids, don't pick favorites. Don't pick favorites. You know, it's, there, there's an irony here because Joseph's brothers, they did not resent the father. They resented the other, the other brother. And it's amazing what we think we want to give to our children is taken away from them be, by the other children. So don't favor your children. I have two kids, and... And uh, I call them the Alpha and the Omega. They're the beginning and the end. And, uh, and I love my children. And I hope that I would give my life for either one of them. But I don't love one of them more than the other. I love their mother more than I love them. But I love my kids the same. Don't favor your children. Don't favor your children. Your children will resent each other. Now, in verses 5 to 8, Joseph had a dream from God. And it's amazing. His brothers hated him for that, didn't they? So he has this dream. He gets, this, he gets favor from his earthly father that he didn't ask for. And he gets this dream from his heavenly father that he didn't ask for. And his brothers just hate him for that. <laughs> Up until this point, we see that it's not even Joseph's fault that his brothers hate him. Verses 9 and 10, Joseph uh, tells his father the dream and, uh, and is rebuked by him. And then in verse 11, Joseph's brothers envy him. See, they wanted what he had. But more than anything, they wanted to take it from him so he didn't have it. That's the difference, and I said this a while back, between covetousness and envy. Covetousness is just wanting what someone else has. Envy is not wanting them to have it. And so I want to take it from you. And that's kind of the bottom of the barrel, isn't it? Where, where maybe your brothers say, say man, this, my other brother over here has it better than I do. He's receiving vision from God. He's receiving favor from God from our father, from our earthly father, and I want to take that from him. And we have to be careful of that. Listen, up until this point, Joseph hadn't done anything wrong. But I think Joseph knew that success is often paved with a road of struggles. How many times in your life have you been through the, quote, unquote, the ringer, right? Been through the ringer. Struggle after struggle after struggle after struggle. Listen, success isn't just something that happens. Success is something you strive for. And in Joseph's case, this wasn't even his fault. Now, let me give you just a, a, a small bit of application that I think is important. Uh, first of all, his own family rejected him. His own family rejected him. Now, I find this amazing parallel between, between Joseph and Jesus. And when we come to John chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, it says that he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Look at verse 11 in John chapter 1. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But what a remarkable parallel between the life of Joseph and the life of Jesus. One would think, one would think that his brothers would be for him. One would think that his dad would be for him. But listen, the very people that you would think would appreciate your vision the most are often the ones that compromise the mission. 
We, we, we say, well, our family's going to be in this. I, I, remember, I remember when I went from northern Minnesota when I was not going to Bible college. 20 years ago, I went to Bible college. And, uh, and when I went there, I remember the, the people I would think would be in it the most would be my parents. You know, that's just not true. They use things like this. Oh, you're throwing away three years of college. But what, what are you going to do with a Bible college degree? I mean, this is what people asked me. This is what my closest, this is what the, the people closest to me were, were asking me, asking me questions like that. And not once did I hear from them, go out there and get them, Joe. Listen, if God has called you to go into the ministry and to learn about our Lord, then go get him. Go do it. Go, go help people. Uh, I was going to school for criminal justice, and as opposed to being a cop, I wanted to become clergy, right? See how I did that with the C's, the cop and the clergy? It just came to my mind. And, and uh, so there I was, and I wanted to go out there, and I just wanted to be, wanted to be something for the Lord. And, and I didn't go to college necessarily because I wanted to be a pastor, though. I wanted to go to college, to Bible college, because I wanted to learn more about my Lord. I, I wanted to know him, not just know about him. And the people that I thought would be the most for me were not. Now, isn't that interesting? But why are the people that are closest to you not always the ones that are in it for you? And let me just give you a, a, a piece of encouragement to this. If, if you want to grow this year, you need to build a culture of growth. You need to have a shared vision, you see. Because if you, can't, if you can't share a vision with those people around you, you're not going to go in the same direction. Friends, if they're not in it with you, you're not going to win it. And so it is that in Joseph's life, he was surrounded by all these people that were really kind of holding him back from doing what was right. He was, he was being held back. Now, of course, we know that Joseph did what was right. As opposed to saying, wow, you know, Joseph, uh, you had this amazing vision, and, and uh, so w we're all going to worship you. Can you tell me a little bit about this? And, and, and can you be an encouragement to us? And can you tell me how this is going to work? They just said, you know what? We don't like him. He's the favored child. He's getting this vision from God, and, and let's just throw him in a pit. Then you know better yet? Let's sell him. Let's sell him because then something's in it for me. See, his brethren were in it for themselves. The people that were closest to him were really in it for themselves. So even those closest to you are not always going to help you to grow. So we have to be careful of this. So that's Joseph's brother, or Joseph's brethren. Let's look at Joseph's boss. Joseph's boss forsook him. He, he, Joseph's boss wasn't in it for, in it for him. When we get to Genesis 39, look at verses 7 to 12. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. And she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house. And he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie, with, or to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there, uh, there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. This amazing record of Joseph's faithfulness, isn't it? This is really important for two reasons. One is this, just this amazing faithfulness. This is a record that most men, you know, let me tell you what, most men would fail. You know, I, I have great confidence in spiritual people, but most men would fail. Now, this is, this is Potiphar's wife. I don't, think she was, uh, I don't think she was a loaf. You know what I mean? I think she was probably a beautiful dame. Can I use that word, dame? Is that all right? Is that a, is that a, it's not a biblical word, but I can use that. She was probably this beautiful woman. 
And, uh, and Joseph was probably a good-looking man. And so there you have this, uh, this good-looking man who is obviously in charge of a lot of different things. He has a kind of a, he probably had this presence about him. Kind of a, a, a dominant player, and, but a loving player, a kind gentleman. And here's this woman who tries to, tries to seduce him. And you know, the record goes down that he was faithful to his God. See, most, I, think, I think a lot of men would give in in this situation. You see, the devil has been trying to destroy men with lust for centuries, forever. We talked a little bit about this in, uh, in Sunday school hour. The culture really hasn't made it any easier. So the devil is just using what man has already been developing. Marketing and all sorts of stuff, trying to, trying to uh, throw his fire, shoot his fiery darts at us to destroy us, right? Is that not what the devil is trying to do? So number one, I, I think this shows a, a faithfulness to God. Secondly, I think this shows Joseph's understanding of who his sin was really against. This is an amazing account because he really got it. You see, I've said for years that if we only had a proper perspective of our sin, we'd have less propensity to sin. You, you know, most of us, we're, 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 we're more concerned with the consequence of our sin. We're more concerned with the ticket we got or uh, being in trouble for something. But it's the consequence for that. It's, uh, well, I did wrong, so I get spanked, and I don't want to get spanked. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to be caught for what I've done. They're more concerned with being caught than the fact that in God's eyes, they're a criminal. And you see, Joseph, he really nailed it, didn't he? Back up in verse 9, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? See, he knew, he knew his sin was against God. He knew that his sin wasn't just against uh, 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 Potiphar. It wasn't just against his, the, the, his wife. It wasn't against his legacy. It was against his Lord. That's the problem. And you see, if we had a better perspective of our sin, if we knew a proper perspective of our sin, like this sin is against God, I think Christianity would be changed. I think the world would be changed. And in Joseph's case, I think he just really, really nailed it here. Our sin is primarily against God. Now, let's think about this in terms of its application. You have Joseph's boss here. And here's what I see. I, I see his owner wasn't really looking out for him either. I mean, his own rejected him, and now his owner's rejecting him. You know, you're there to fulfill your boss's dreams. You're not there so your boss can fulfill yours. And how many times do we, do we enter into a situation thinking that my boss really has my best interest in mind? Now, you might say, now, you don't know my boss. He's a great boss. I, I, he's, he's just this loving guy. But you know what? He possesses a sin. And you know what that sin is? Selfishness. Your boss is selfish. It's true. And you're selfish. And I'm selfish. And my kids are selfish. And my wife is selfish. And you know what? We all possess that sin nature. Your, 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 boss, your boss is really looking out for his bottom dollar. It, your boss is concerned with his profit growth, not your personal growth. Your boss, now, only unless it benefits them. And, and there's, there's a blend there, too. Isn't that interesting? Your boss wants you to be better so that you can be better at your job. Because really, it's about them. You say, well, that's really pessimistic. I have a great boss. And you might have a great boss. Not every boss is a jerk. And not every boss all the time is only looking out for them. But across the board, I'm just saying, as a, as a commonality, they're in it for them. Remember, you are your best advocate. If you want to grow, you have to look beyond your brethren. You have to look beyond your boss, and you have to say, how is it that I can grow and please the Lord this year? How can I grow my finances? How can I grow, how can I grow my educational level? How can I do better to please the Lord? Because quite honestly, your brothers aren't looking out for you. Your boss isn't looking out for you. Now let's look at uh, an, another one. How about your buddies? Remember, Joseph had, uh, he met two buddies, didn't he, in prison? He was thrown in prison, and there was a, there was a butler and a baker. And uh, obviously, they had, a, uh, they had some, they displeased the, the leadership, and the leadership threw them in prison, and here Joseph was, winds up in jail as well. 
And so kind of a, a, a really neat story, really. I mean, when they think about it, uh, so you have these two men in prison and, and they have these dreams. And remember, Joseph is known for, for his uh, uh, translating dreams. So uh, he says, I can take care of this one. And he goes over to the chief, uh, the chief, the butler and the baker, and he says, uh, he says, I can interpret these dreams. And he says, okay, well, he says, well, uh, basically, uh, you're both going to get out, but sorry, baker, you're going to die. He says, whoa, okay, so they get out, they get released. But before they release, uh, Joseph says to, says to the butler, remember me. Will you just remember me? When you get to the top of the ladder, will you remember the guy who's holding the bottom? Will you remember the guy who carried the ladder for you? Will you remember the one who put forth the effort to get you to where you're at? I can help you with this. And you know what? They get out, Genesis 40, verse 23. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forget him. Boy, it's amazing how oftentimes we help somebody to get where they're, where they're successful. This is your buddy here. These are the guys, these are your comrades, right? These are the ones that you think, hey, man, we're in this thing together, right? And, and, and we're, 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 we're willing to work together at this, and I'm willing to help you out. But when you get to the top, man, just remember, you, you have the king's ear. You, 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 have some, you have some persuasiveness there. I mean, all you need to do is tell him that I'm back here, and he'll let me out. And you know what? When it, your buddies aren't going to look out for you, though. It's just true. I, I tell you, there's, your boss isn't looking out for you. Your brethren aren't looking out for you. You know the lesson that I think Joseph learned here is not to put his trust in men. Don't trust man. Psalm 118, verse 8 says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. How many times have we, as a, as a Christian, as a person, we, I mean, we want to trust people. It's true. We want to trust people. We want to just put uh, just a load of, uh, uh, of, we just, everything we have, we would say, we want to just trust you. And, and God says, it's, it's better not to do that. Trust in me. And you know what? When his buddies were gone, you know the only person there for Joseph? It was God. It was God. Because when nobody has your back, God's there for you. Proverbs 25, 19, confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Anybody had a broken tooth? I've had two of them. I've had two of them. Praise God, we have a dentist, you know, in the church. And, and uh, Now, none of them hurt, though. They didn't hurt. And the first thing they ask you is, is, you, is, it, there's a, is there sensation, like cold or heat? And I just, I thank God. I said, I, I can stand the cold. I don't have to drink any water, but I have to drink coffee. And so if it, if it hurts, just yank it out. And, uh, and so the first one was a back one. And, uh, and, and that was because I ate a frozen cookie. And then I broke a front one. And I'm not going to tell you what I was biting down on. But at any rate, uh, I just decided not to eat at all anymore and just to take things through an IV. That's not true. I've never had a, a, a foot out of joint, but I've rolled my ankle. How many of you roll an ankle? You know what it feels like to roll an ankle? Brutal. Isn't it just brutal? So some of us had broken teeth. Some of us had foot out of, uh, foot out of joint. Uh, I've rolled my ankle and had a little broken tooth. But at the end of the day, the confidence, confidence in an unfaithful man. It's like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. It's amazing as, as, as Christians, as people, we just, we just really want to trust people, don't we? We just want to trust them. We want to put our, put our whole, we put all of our weight behind them. We just say, well, I want to trust you. I want to. And, and, and what the lesson that Joseph learned was, you know what? Your buddies aren't there for you all the time. Your boss isn't looking out for you. Your brethren aren't there for you. You know, if you want to grow as a Christian, if you want to grow and be somebody different, you have to look to the one who can make the difference, which is only God. I'm not saying that your buddies aren't helpful. I'm not saying that your brethren aren't helpful. I'm not saying your boss isn't helpful at times. But they are all sinners. And they are all prone to selfishness. There's only one person I know that was selfless. There's only one. 
and his name was Jesus. And he, he showed us this selflessness, didn't he? He showed us this selflessness by coming to this earth to die on a cross for your sin. Now, even if we were to die for someone else, I'm not sure that we would be 100% clean of that. I might want to die for, for, for Josh because I love him dearly and, and, I, I, and, and, and I, don't want him to, I don't want him to go to heaven quite yet. So I'm, I'm willing to die for him and, and trying to protect the family and his brother and, and, and mom all at the same time. And, and, and is there in there some selfishness? Well, can we be 100% selfless? Can we do that? No, I don't think we can. But we know a God who can. We know a God who did. His name was Jesus. If you're here today, you don't know where you're going when you die. Can I tell you that the God of the universe died for your sin and he was doing it selflessly? And he did it because he loves you. We talked a little bit about it in Sunday school. He knew that people would reject him and he still died for them. It amazes me that an all-knowing God would die for someone who would reject him. But millions and millions of people do. They reject him all the time. They don't just reject the idea of being a Christian. They reject while they are a Christian. How many people deny the Lord when the Lord leans on you a little bit and says, you know, you need to do this. You need to be better. You need to grow in this area. You say, no, Lord, I'm fine where I'm at. Can I tell you, that's denying the prompting of the Holy Spirit. That's denying God. That's rejecting him. Just like someone can reject the notion of salvation, someone can reject the idea of sanctification. Sanctification is growth. We need to be better Christians. To become a Christian is easy. It's you placing your faith in Jesus Christ to die for you. That's, that's, that's the easy part. Now God says, I want you to grow. I want you to be better Christians. I want you to be better husbands and better wives and better fathers and better uh, mothers and, and better bosses, better brothers and sisters. I want you to grow. You know, they're not out there looking out for you. And the Lord said, but I am looking out for you. I am going to help you. You just trust me. When everybody else rejects you, when your brothers try to kill you, try to sell you, when your boss denies, won't listen to you, just listens to fables, lies about you, when your, when your buddies are saying, hey, man, I want to be with you, and then, boom, they're gone. God says, I'm still here for you. I want you to grow. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, I beg you to trust him today. And it's simple. It's when you, in the quietness of your own mind, say this, Lord, the best I know how I believe Jesus died for me. I believe he paid for my sins. And there's nothing that I can do to earn my salvation. A lot of churches today try to say, well, you just you live a better life and you're going to heaven. That's not true. You don't go to heaven because you're living a better life. You're going to heaven because you trust the, trusted the one who lived the best life, perfect life. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. Someone had to die and Jesus died for you. Will you believe that today? I hope you will. Next week, I'm going to be in Israel. I'm going to be standing on, on, the, uh, on the water. No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to be standing on the, on the seashore there. And, uh, and I, I love going over there because I feel, I feel so close to him, to the Lord. Now, we know that he's not there in that place. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's everywhere because he's omnipresent, but we understand what I'm saying. But I just feel so close to him. And I, I, want you to feel, I want you to feel that closeness to God. I want you to feel that closeness when you're not in Israel. I want you to feel that closeness now in, in, in your very seat when you just know firsthand, I have trusted Jesus as my Savior. And when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. Whether you're young or whether you're old, you can do that today.